Thank you and welcome. I'm going to start by framing our conversation briefly about fighting for democracy in Israel and Palestine. How did we get here? And let me explain what I mean by that. I think we all agree that Israel is having a democratic crisis, and I think we need to diagnose it correctly. Are we having this crisis because alien forces of extremism have suddenly sprung up within Israel, maybe cynically manufactured by politicians? Or are there deep, long-term roots that we need to confront? Why are we talking about democracy and Israel and Palestine as if it's all our responsibility? This seems to be something of an acknowledgement that at present, for the moment, there's only one state that currently holds meaningful political, military, economic, and diplomatic power in the region. It's becoming increasingly hard to maintain the image of temporariness to the occupation. And that's why we need to ask how Israeli politics, society, and policy affects all people of the region, or the reverse. How does the fact of ongoing conflict and occupation color and influence and maybe even control Israeli society and politics. Let me put out a final framing question. Is there any separation really between the profoundly undemocratic nature of permanent occupation and what we often think of as Israel's domestic issues, particularly these theocratic elements we're seeing trying to dominate Israeli policy and education, family law, sexuality, but also the abiding attacks on Israel's democratic institutions, particularly the judicial branch. These are long and complicated questions. Luckily, I don't have to answer them. Uh, for that, I am gonna turn to my panelists and I'm delighted to have them. Uh, honored, actually, to be moderating this conversation. I'll introduce them. Um, Esther Solomon is the editor-in-chief of Haaretz English. She moved to Israel in 1998, originally from London, where she studied English literature at Cambridge International Relations at LSE. She ran the opinion section at Haaretz, which she helped to establish for 16 years before becoming editor-in-chief. She also writes herself on wide-ranging issues. Read her stuff. I recommend it, everything that she writes. Uh, she's a founder of Kihilat Yacha, the progressive modern orthodox community in Tel Aviv. Jacob Magid is the US correspondent of the Times of Israel. Uh, he covers developments in the US relating to Israel, the Middle East, and the Jewish world. Prior to that, he covered everything you ever wanted to know about settlements. Uh, as the Times of Israel's West Bank correspondent. Now, we have a very brief session, so we're gonna be efficient. I am going to do three rounds of one question for both panelists. Each one will answer, and then we'll wrap. Okay. So let me start with you, Esther, and this again, this is the same question to both panelists, and we'll try to get three rounds in here. After the 2022 elections and the political forces that were unleashed, do you see this as a major rupture from Israel's political trajectory, or do you see any aspect that is deep levels of continuity? I think to take the, the most uh, important aspect first, it definitely is a deep rupture, and it is a watershed that we all have to recognize as such. There's absolutely no point sugarcoating what has happened. Israel now has its most right-wing, racist, and theocratic government ever. Um, I think that Haaretz colonist uh, Yossi Verta put it quite well when he said, the incomprehensible is fact, the hallucination is reality. That in some ways describes uh, not only what has happened, but also the state of shock of many uh, in Israel, in the center and the left, about the prospect of a government that really is the most extremist in Israel's history. If we just go back, in 1984, which was the last time that Mayor Kahana, who was you know, the father of uh, this Jewish variant of fascism, was allowed to stand for the Knesset, he won 26,000 votes. This year, religious Zionism, which is the name of the party that continues, at least part of it continues his legacy, they won more than half a million votes. So that is to say more than 10% of Israelis voted uh, for this particular party, and half of all Israelis voted for a bloc that was happy to sit with this party. There is not really much way to say that uh, this is anything other than uh, a rupture in uh, Israel's history. This is the first time most of the government, uh, the sitting uh, members of the government, the MKs, are orthodox or ultra-orthodox. That's also a first. Uh, 
just a year and a half ago, for the Bennett government when it was sworn in, it, won, uh, it appointed a record nine women to the cabinet. That was also a record number of women in cabinet positions. Now in this government, there are nine women in the 64 member coalition uh, that will be in power. Nine women MKs, forget about cabinet ministries. We're talking about net, just net the number of women in a 64 member block, there are nine of them. So, so in all of those ways, it clearly is a, a big difference, but we can't avoid the fact that it is building on trends that have been going on for a while. You know, Israel's been moving rightwards. The left block has somewhat collapsed. The young vote is definitely moving quite a lot more rightwise. Uh, and many people would say that, you know, one of the threads is that the occupation has normalized the level of violence and abuse of human rights uh, that is now seeping into uh, Israeli discourse uh, in general. Thank you. Perfectly on time. Three minutes. Two of them. <laughs> All right. So I'll try to be a little bit more optimistic, but not really. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you were here and if there was, a, there was a conference in 2015, but I'm pretty sure some of the reactions to the election in Israel in that year might have been kind of sounded what, to what we're hearing now, which is the end of the world. And we're close. We are very close. But um, that was at the point where Netanyahu had also won a majority. Uh, the right wing had a, 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 almost a homogenous government in a lot of ways. Um, and yet, what we saw in the next uh, seven, eight years is no formal annexation. Uh, there hasn't been a radical change on the ground with how Palestinians are treated. On the other hand, there was, we did see the nation law passed, the nation state law passed that kind of elevated or enshrined Israel's Jewish character above its democratic character, and I think that's created a lot of tailwind to some of the moves that we've seen since. Now, the unity government that we had over the past about roughly a year managed to, I think, roll back some of those trends, and we saw restarting meetings between senior Israeli and Palestinian officials, thousands of work permits that were approved for, for Palestinians to come work in, in Israel and the settlements, uh, the legalization of thousands of their status in the West Bank. Um, de facto, though, I think we still continue to see a lot of the, the steps in the West Bank that the Biden administration's worked to stop. On the other hand, they have what we, in 2011, we talked about there was a freeze in settlements for 11 months that the Obama administration worked tirelessly to institute um, and, and exhaust a lot of political capital. The Biden administration has actually managed over the past year, almost a year and a half, to quietly institute something similar where there's been no meetings of the planning committee to advance settlements. So those are the kinds of things that have happened over the past year. Um, on the other hand, though, I would caution this point out, there hasn't really been the shrinking of the conflict that the Biden administration or the Prime Ministers Netanyahu and Lapid talked about. Um, and there's not been a Palestinian Prime Minister who's been willing to meet with uh, sorry, an Israeli prime minister who's been willing to meet with uh, Mahmoud Abbas, and no real follow-up on a few of those, the plans that the U.S. has announced. But there has, um, so I wouldn't maybe, I don't know if I would go far as to say this is a rupture. I think it's more of a return to what we saw pre this government and an acceleration in some of those trends um, that we saw before the unity government came into power. And those trends related to the putting the kind of the enshrining the Jewish character, but what Orthodox Jews review, view as the Jewish character above the democratic character. Um, and that will, and I think what we can expect moving forward is that acceleration of those trends. No, the, gone are the days where Defense Minister Gantz or whoever it will be that replaces him hosts the pa Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. Gone are the days of um, strengthening the PA and also I think killings of Palestinian protesters will likely go up because now we have in government in Israel people who are kind of cheerleading uh, soldiers who are uh, misbehaving or uh, assaulting or, or um, mistreating activists and, and, and Palestinians. Okay, so first of all, apologies to my panelists for pressuring you, but we're trying to get through lots of material here. Um, I wanna ask a second question. As we see the government sh taking shape, that we think is taking shape, uh, the ideas, the people, the policies, the parties involved, and the people they represent. How do you see these things manifesting in policy, law, or changes in Israeli life? And again, try to keep this to two and a half minutes. Let's see, yeah, so we okay. time for the last question. All right, um, so the, the agreement that uh, the Likud, Netanyahu's party made with Otsma Yehudit, uh, the far-right uh, Kahana-ist party, um, gives uh, Itamar Ben-Gvir 
authority over border police in the, in the West Bank, which regularly interacts with West, uh, settlers and with Palestinians. He'll have broader control over the entire police force as a national security minister, and this is a force that is heavily involved in conduct on the Temple Mount and the Al-Aqsa Al -Aqsa Mosque compound. And this is someone who's pushed for eroding or changing the status quo in that, in that, in that area where Jews are currently not allowed to pray. And this is something that he's tried to, he's campaigned against. Um, will he announce, I think, tomorrow or whenever he's uh, in that, uh, instituting the government, a new, a new status quo in the Temple Mount? I don't think so. I think Netanyahu will, will really prevent that to, uh, to ha from happening because I think he really cares about maintaining the Abraham Accords um, that he's managed to bring forward a couple of years ago. Uh, but I do think we'll see, and it continued like we were going to see in the West Bank, where this erosion of the status quo there, I think we'll see it also in terms of the status quo on the Temple Mount, um, more turning a blind eye to Jewish prayer, uh, more active police presence there, and those are kinds of things that really can spark conflict, not just in Jerusalem, but as we've seen in the May 2021 Gaza War, in, the, in West Bank, in Gaza, and um, in, even in, mixed, in the so-called mixed cities in Israel. Um, I think Palestinian protesters will likely meet uh, more lethal force with uh, Itamar Ben-Gvir is talking about changing the rules of, of, rules of engagement for when the uh, soldiers can open fire. Do I think that there'll be an official change in those rules? I don't think so. It's still the IDF that kinds of, kinds of controls those, those issues. But I do think when you have, again, lawmakers who are more willing to defend uh, misaction or inaction or inappropriate action by Pal Israeli soldiers, those kinds of things are likely to go up. In the defense ministry, um, we'll have uh, the, the religious Zionism party led by Betsalo Smotrich uh, will be in charge of the civil administration and COGAT, which are two bodies that are in, responsible for settlement approvals, for Palestinian home demolitions, for outpost legalizations, for uh, authorizing Palestinian building permits. So just uh, predict which uh, trend you think those issues will go in, and that's uh, where we'll be heading, I think, under this government. Again, maybe no formal annexation, but I think de facto is what we'll likely be seeing. Um, I'll cut it for now. Thank you. Feel free to ask me about what the Biden administration will do afterwards. <laughs> Well, I think the, the, one of the most significant uh, changes and probably one of the first that we will see is this assault on the, uh, the Supreme Court, which is uh, sometimes called the judicial override uh, uh, law that uh, pretty much everyone in the new coalition uh, is willing and bound uh, to pass that will prevent uh, the Supreme Court from adjudicating about laws uh, in the Knesset, or rather there won't be a, a possibility of appealing to the Supreme Court if the Knesset passes rules that are considered uh, to be unconstitutional in, in the, the broad sense that uh, Israel has in terms of its basic laws in the absence of a natural constitution. And that has you know, enormous potential effects for uh, the rule of law uh, in Israel and has already created uh, significant concern within Israel and abroad. Uh, but the tentacles of, uh, of the potential uh, effect of the inclusion of the far right in the government go into almost every uh, aspect of uh, civ civil society life in Israel, from the educational system, where they're more likely than not to limit the kinds of uh, content of, of secular schools, which so far have uh, avoided being uh, um, influenced by um, religious and, and super nationalistic content, that's creating a huge amount of, uh, of fear in Israel at the moment. There's going to be some kind of attack on the LGBTQ plus community of some kind. You know, the minister in charge of uh, Jewish identity is also from the far right, and he's called them the gay community deviants in the past, so there's not that much uh, we can expect. Uh, there will be uh, likely some kind of uh, attempted uh, uh, attack on um, uh, conversion and the law of return, and who is uh, who can make aliyah, which will have all sorts of impacts on uh, refugees, for instance, from the Ukraine who may or may not be allowed in, and obviously more widely in terms of how diaspora Jews relate to Israel as a country that could and would accept them as Jews. Thank you. 
I'd like to try to ask one last question, and this is going to be the most important of all in some ways. Uh, you know, the winners of this election are not the final word. Uh, the number of people who voted for the parties supporting Netanyahu's supporting bloc versus the number of people who voted for the parties that opposed going into a coalition with Netanyahu were almost evenly divided. Very small majority, but very small for, uh, for the Netanyahu bloc. That's about half the voters. Who, did, who voted in opposition to Netanyahu, that's a lot of people. What unifies them? Is, can we identify a unifying theme? I mean, commentators have begun, begun to call this the democratic camp on some level, partly because of what Esther mentioned, the attacks on the judiciary that have come to characterize the far right. Do you see old themes, new themes, emerging themes, which are likely to be failures, which are likely to be mobilizing and successful in the future, in your opinion? And for this, I'll start with Esther again, and then go back to Jacob, and then we'll wrap up. Well, yes, the truth is that roughly 50% of Israelis didn't vote for the, gov for the government that is in formation. So in effect, that is a 50% of the population that you have to build some kind of, um, you know, in the words of, you know, 2016 in America, some kind of resistance movement. The problem is that uh, it is a very uh, fragmented, uh, it's not really one camp, it's fragmented firstly between Jewish Israelis and Arab Israelis. Uh, there are certainly efforts to try and bring um, uh, Jewish and Arab uh, Israelis together into one kind of camp that is uh, more fundamentally uh, uh, acknowledging uh, each other's uh, needs than, than the political uh, configurations that have been before. The question is really if that is more likely to succeed, all the kinds of issues that will affect people in their everyday lives, that is when their children come back from school and tell, tell their parents what they've been taught that day. You know, it's about people with um, uh, friends and children and colleagues who are from minority communities who experience discrimination on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that these are probably the, the issue. If there is more segregation of women in the public sphere, I think that, to be honest, uh, these are the kinds of issues that are more likely to get people out on the streets. Thank you. Good. Yeah, I, I'd agree. There's little that unites this coalition, and what it, or the, now it's in the opposition, that was all, it was just Netanyahu, that they didn't want Netanyahu to return to power. So trying to find some sort of issue is definitely challenging, and I think I'm not going to pretend like I know for sure the answer, but I do think that we have seen coalitions being tried to be built around this idea of democracy, of preventing the erosion of the justice system, of opposing religious coercion. We have seen those things. Um, but I think um, even from the left, when there's, a, there's an attempt to kind of try to stress this idea that we've just heard about, about um, separating from the Palestinians, which does have carry some um, acceptance among a lot of Israelis, but I think it also alienates um, the Palestinian citizens of Israel. And I think it's a numbers game, right? Um, it's possible that the center left doesn't really have the majority there to kind of put together a coalition of that kind of nature. Um, but again, trying to win at some sort of majority while ignoring 20% of the population, which is Palestinian citizens of Israel, is kind of like trying to fight a, uh, make a fight without, with a hand tied behind your back. And there, I would, when we talk about genuine Arab-Israeli partnership, or Arab, sorry, Arab-Jewish partnership in Israel, um, it can't go, it can't just be a cliche. It has to extend beyond um, quietly cooperating behind closed doors. There has to be a willingness amongst Israeli politicians to actually and publicly talk about and be proud of the Arab-Israeli, Arab-Jewish cooperation, sorry. Um, and not be condemning every Palestinian lawmaker every time they say anything related to the Palestinian cause. And there has to be an ability to, to understand where they're coming from. And I think until you do that, and until you actually are willing to build a coalition that at least sees commonality on, those, on, on these kinds of issues, um, it's going to be very difficult to, to unite. I think the last thing I'll say is that there's this assumption that uh, there's nothing in common between the, the Jewish resident of Tel Aviv and, and a Palestinian resident of Nazareth. But I don't know how much there is really in common, or less there is in common with, with a Likud voter from Sterot and a, ultra, a United Torah Judaism ultra-Orthodox party from Bnei Brak. Um, but yet, Netanyahu has managed to get those two kinds of populations to work almost um, seamlessly in a block that has controlled the Israeli political game for quite some time, even with this one-year break. 
And, and I think and until we see uh, Arab and, and Jewish lawmakers working together in that kind of seamlessness, I don't think we'll see a sort of majority that we're talking about. Thank you to the panelists for working with me on long, hard, very many, you know, lots of material and very little time. I will take moderator's prerogative, even though we've almost run out the clock, and try to summarize a few points about democracy. What worries me the most is the attempt in Israel to redefine what democracy is. So let's just review briefly what it's not. Democracy is not just majority rule. It is not just one branch of government. It is not just elections. An electoral democracy is a stripped down democracy missing a lot of pieces. Democracy is not just governance. It's civil society, it's active engagement of citizens, and it's values and norms. And you can't have a democracy where some are equal. Democracy is based on self-determination and equality for all. Thank you. Hello, J Street.